Hi, good afternoon. <clears throat> Um, thank you for inviting Project Search UK over to talk to your conference today. Um, I'm here on behalf of Project Search UK and also um, Project Search USA. Some of you may or may not know that Project Search originated um, in the States and so predominantly um, my talk is going to use some of the examples from the States but I've added in some from the UK too because I have slightly more personal knowledge of those examples. Um, as um, our chair said, in, in the UK we use the term learning disability, where I know that you use intellectual disability, but please forgive me if I move around between the two as I forget which one I'm supposed to be using. But we, we are basically talking about the same group of people, but you know what it's like when you get passionate about something, sometimes you forget to use the absolute correct words for the environment that you're in, so um, please do forgive that. <clears throat> Um, you should all have had a handout as well when you came in. Um, that's just a, a brief two-sided to give you a little bit of information to go away with. I should also point out um, at the back, um, on page two of that handout, towards the top, you'll see an email address there for my colleague, Anne O'Brien. She's the um, UK lead for Project Search and is the person to... Um, whom you should direct a, any further interest. Of course, I'm going to be happy to answer any questions that I can, but Anne is our lead in the UK that you should do, um, direct any further interest to. Okay. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Project Search began in um, Cincinnati Children's Hospital uh, in the uh, USA by um, a lady called Erin Riley. She was the, she's a nurse by background and she was head of um, accident and emergency services. Um, she noticed that there was a lot of high turnover in some of the entry level posts. Um, and coincident with that, she also realized that the hospital who provided a lot of services to um, children and young people with intellectual disability actually had none of those people represented on the staff group. I should also apologize for peering at you over my glasses, but if I do that, you also go into horrible disfocus. So I'm sorry if I look a bit school marmish, but I need to do both. <clears throat> As I was saying, she noticed that they had um, nobody on the staff team who represented a large number of the people who used their service. And um, she felt that with the entry level jobs needing to represent their client group, then perhaps there was something they could do um, to fix both of those problems. And kind of, um, she didn't know anybody at the time with an intellectual disability, so she went to her local service, her local school. And that's how Project Search. Um, was born really and it was born in 1996 so it has been going for some time in the in the states um, and it currently has 200 project searches across um, 40 states it also has project search in Canada um, Australia and in the UK over the last three years we're in our third year at the moment <clears throat> This is a key phrase for uh, those of us who work within Project Search, which is about, you know, every, everyone with a disability should have a right of, um, to choose a path toward education and employment. And while freedom of choice is a given, the right to work is earned. And earning the right to work is very much dependent upon the young person's preparation to move into the work site. If you've got an intellectual disability, then you're probably going to need more than sometimes the average person. You're going to need those people who are responsible for providing you with an opportunity to work, preparing for you to work, to work together more. And, and partnership is um, the key to success within Project Search. So this is very much what it looks like. Um, it's, this is our uh, kind of attempt. And if I was um, as a whiz at IT as some of the guys who were here this morning, in the centre of that pentagon, it would say intern, because this is all around the group of young people. And I've tried and failed, so if anyone wants to put that in for us, we would be grateful. Um, Project Search is very much a partnership, and it's led by the business that we're in. 
And I've been fortunate enough to be involved in um, getting on for eight or nine of the projects in the States. And I'm um, sorry, in the UK. And I visited uh, two or three in the States. And all of them have a different flavour and atmosphere and culture. And that's because they are led by the business. So they reflect the culture of the business that they operate within. Um, the business leads and shapes the project and provides for the project um, a classroom, a business liaison who helps us negotiate our way around the business, and opportunities for the young people to have internships. Project Search literally picks a classroom of young people from their last year of school or college and moves them over and puts them down in a host business. So they go with their educator, with any classroom support, they join forces with a supported employment provider and they have some education to their day and they have some work, ex work placements to their day. And at the end of the day, they come back and talk about their experiences. And I'll talk a little bit more about the detail of that in a moment. The supported employment agency will provide us with a job coach. Um, and the local authority in the UK in many instances has been the catalyst for involving Project Search and got the partners together. Um, they also might provide ongoing support for young people who perhaps are needing to move or who need funding or they might do some kind of personal management to support them. Long-term support is very much aimed at once um, the young people have graduated that they have that job development to, if they're not employed by the host business, to get a job um, fairly soon after graduation. And that window of opportunity that we have where people are used to going out all day, it's five days a week, and we don't want them to become used to being unemployed and not doing very much. <clears throat> um, Project Search can run from school or it, or it can run from college, and it does both in the UK and, and has a broad um, age range. Okay. Um, this is uh, Lee. Lee um, is a successful graduate of Project Search in the UK. He <clears throat> is someone who has a fairly low level of literacy and numeracy. He's much more practice orientated, if you like. He's not someone who's going to um, be. Uh, enabled to work in administration because of his uh, literacy um, limitations. He had already attended college, he had a very supportive family, he'd been through six months of the project and was determined as ever to work. He had a fail-safe attendance record. <clears throat> um, during his third rotation, the job coach was able to negotiate for him an opportunity whereby uh, one of the porters had left and they needed their cardboard. Uh, hospitals generate loads of cardboard in packaging. You might not know that. They need to do something with it. So he would go around emptying all the cardboard bins, packaging it all up, ready for recycling. That, however, didn't finish his day. Thank you. Excuse me. It's hot up here. Um, so... The other thing that had caused the um, head of domestic services quite a lot of distress was the state of the car parks. And um, so they divided the hospital car parks into five zones, and he was taught how to litter pick those five zones. What that did for him was get him noticed by the managers of the place where he worked, because it immediately approved the appearance of the hospital to anybody who used it. And this gave Lee status. So towards the end of the year, the job coach unashamedly used Lee's status to negotiate a paid job for him. And he's now been holding that job down for a year. He's had things added, and his hours have increased, and he works full time um, at a hospital because of Project Search, mainly. It is modelled after an existing kind of educational initiatives. Internships are... are cover all sorts of careers. Um, I'm an occupational therapist by background, so I, when I was training, I went into hospitals and community services and learned how, practically how to be an OT. These students or interns go practically into businesses and learn how to work. 
um, and they learn marketable skills that can then be marketed to an employer. These are some of the examples of um, Project Search International. These are the kind of um, organisations that have Project Search sites. So you can see, yes, it is public sector. In the UK, it is very much mostly public, public sector. Um, but in the US, they've diversified into banking, universities, park districts and zoos, manufacturing, distribution centres, so warehousing, and all that that involves um, retirement communities, so the care sector, and in the oil industry which still seems to be making loads of money out of this all, doesn't it? But anyway, might as well use it. Um, specifically around the UK, there are now 16 sites. 12 are in hospitals, 3 are in councils, and we have one private sector business services company. Um, <clears throat> in uh, 2010, the, there were four sites that graduated, so they started in 2009, finished in 2010, and they achieved 21 jobs, or 63% of the graduates walked away with the job. Now, that means there are still 37% who haven't, 37, 37% who haven't, and we need to improve that. Um, last year, uh, 2011, there were 16 sites, there was 116 graduates, and I'm happy to say that our percentage has gone up to 50, 58% over the last couple of weeks, so it's growing. And I think what you need to remember is that, that we're still learning how to do project search, but when you consider um, that the national average for people with learning disabilities in paid employment in the UK is 6.5%, 58% is quite an achievement for us. Yes, we are still worried about the other 42. And, and we won't let go of them. Um, you can see there that five of the sites have achieved over 60%, and we do have one site that's achieved 100% success, so all of their graduates got a job. Um, that site in particular worked with a very experienced um, supported employment provider who saw that three months after the students graduated as a real opportunity, so they put a lot of effort into job development for those individuals, both within the organisation but also external too. And that's why they had, one of the reasons they had such a high success rate. <clears throat> as you can see there, the project has been listed as best practice in a number of um, the UK papers that you may or may not be um, familiar with. Okay, so what does the programme look like? It is an annual programme. It goes over one academic year, so September to July, broadly speaking, and there are eight to 12 students. 12 is the maximum. Most places begin with eight, because you don't kind of learn to run before you can, can walk. Um, the certified instructor there really covers anyone who, because if it's a school, it will be a teacher. If it's a college, they might call them a lecturer or a tutor, so certified instructor doesn't offend anybody. But it is that kind of teachery type person who is in charge of curriculum and class. Um, and um, job coaches who will, might lead on the employment side of things. That doesn't mean to say that the class tutors or the class teachers don't get involved in on-the-job coaching. They do, and they will come through some training with their job coaches in order to enable them to do that, which is an interesting journey for some of those teachers who are used to standing up and doing classroom stuff to do that one-on-one -on -one support where you're trying to be invisible. If anyone's ever done job coaching will know. Um, Project Search is designed to be the last year of education. It should be where people finish their education and move into employment. It's a transition year. It's not just a year you go and do to see whether you like work or not and then go back to college. That, if that's what you're interested in, go and do something else. That's not what we, we're going to spend our precious Project Search year doing. Um, during that year, the uh, interns will have three rotations, so they'll have three separate work um, placements within the same um, host business. So you can see that the businesses need to be large enough in order to provide that sort of opportunity for people. And always the outcome is employment um, and paid employment and full-time, if at all possible, please. 
Okay. Um, these are eligibility guidelines. They do vary from project to project, but generally speaking, young people are between 17 and 24 years old, that they might have some of the appropriate skills for the business. Um, or they have the potential to develop those skills, so hygiene, social skills, communication, that type of stuff. And that people do have the ability to take direction and change behaviour and learn how to work. Project Search isn't for every young person with an intellectual disability. You know, it, it's not the panacea to all ills, but it wor really works for a number of um, young people with learning disabilities. Um, we do ask that people have a willingness to access public transport to get them to work and back, and that's about growing up and maturing and becoming independent. Um, if you work in the... Do you know what a CRB check is? That's kind of our check to say that you haven't, you know, um, got some kind of criminal history, so therefore you can work with the public. In, uh, in the UK, to work with vulnerable people, you need to have an enhanced CRB to demonstrate that you're um, not a risk to the people you might be with. Obviously, that's going to be important for people working in hospitals and councils. But however, people do not have to meet higher level academic requirements, as we saw with Lee. It's um, uh, important that that can't be stressed enough. This is a practice-based learning program. Um, just a little bit about the research about what works for people with intellectual disabilities moving into employment. <clears throat> and what Project Search offers. It teaches the young people how to solve problems and to use initiative. And isn't that what you see a lot when you're looking for people to work? They want people to solve their own problems, take initiative and work well together. It will promote adult rather than immature thinking processes. You know, working for the team, not working for myself. Um, it will promote teamwork, and by that we mean proper teamwork, where people ask you know, each other how, how things are going and, and um, working together towards the common goal. Um, and also, work-based learning promotes social relationships, and appropriate social relationships at work, and the difference between being friendly with a colleague and being a friend and the split therein, which is sometimes a learning curve for some of the young people that we've worked with. Um, the project turns, interns will average 800 to 900 um, hours in a year, so that gives them a lot of experience in the workplace. The internships are the corner of project search. They're the, they're the elements that teach um, the young people marketable skills. Um, they will complete four to five hours a day, 800 to 900 hours a year, and that gives a lot of opportunity for them to layer on skills. The idea of Project Search is that you just build and build and build your skills as far as you can go so that you have the most opportunity to be competitive in the labour market at the end of the year. Each rotation lasts around 10 to 12 weeks, and they generally follow kind of terms, so that's why they vary, because Easter moves around, doesn't it, and stuff like that, anyway. Um, and they are flexible. <clears throat> they are supernumerary to the staff number. They shouldn't be um, uh, instead of or replace the staff member. They should be supernumerary to that staff member. But a department does need to have enough work to keep the student busy. Where um, there have been any difficulty in internships is where managers of departments have underestimated people's ability, where they've taken what they think your average employee can do and chopped it in half and then given that to the intern. And so, of course, by lunchtime, they're twiddling their thumbs and kind of, what, we do, what do we do now? And, of course, that's when you get issues. So we do say to people, no, just give us what you would expect anyone to do when they start work. Because it is different, our turnover and our productivity is different when we start work to when we have been in work for a while. Um, just interestingly, one of the things that we've learned is that although the students might take a little longer to learn a job, there is some research that demonstrates that they maintain performance and productivity at a higher rate than most other employees in the same job. Which is good for business, isn't it? 
Students, um, the interns, I beg your pardon, do have continuous feedback and assessment about their performance and how they're doing. That assessment isn't about should this person be working or should they not be working, it's about how do we make a job work? What does it need to look like to maintain somebody's interest and to help them grow and develop a career? This is um, the annual um, schedule, if you like, or the annual programme. Um, starts in September. Um, the young people have two-week induction, both into kind of the academic side of project search or the learning side, and into the business that they're going to be working in. So what are the business priorities? What's health and safety? What does manual handling look like? And some of that is taken from the mainstream, what happens for anyone else, and then just perhaps broken down and gone through more than once and in a couple of different ways so we know that it really sticks with people. Confidentiality in hospitals is a big one, for instance, so they might go through that a couple of times. And then the pattern follows. They have breaks where they have workshops where they consolidate learning, build up their CVs, and think about where they're going to go. Job development or employment planning starts the minute they work through the door so that we, they know, we know, their families know what the goal is and you work towards that all the time. Some young people might be fortunate enough to get a job and not complete the, the year. That's absolutely fine because they've, they've achieved their goal, they've achieved an outcome um, for us and for them. OK, so this is what a typical day looks like. It does vary slightly. Um, so they'll have employability skills at the beginning of the day. That's kind of, you know, all of those things that you need to know that makes you a good person at work, being on time, um, dressing appropriately, having your hair done, having no, no makeup or the right amount of makeup and the right clothes and what's appropriate social communication, how do you stay fit and healthy for work, all the sorts of things that we probably could have done with when we were younger, but everyone just expected us to pick it up. Um, but they're set about and, and they're taught. And then, as I said before, they have their time on the work sites. And lunch is at the department's convenience. The interns are not expected back in the classroom for lunch necessarily. That's, again, to promote their independence, to work with their colleagues, etc. And then they come back and they all keep a learning log or a journal about their experiences and what went on during the day and how did that reflect what they learnt in the morning and put it into practice, all to help make this learning to work a very concrete experience for people because that's what people with intellectual disabilities need on the whole. They need that concrete experience because imagination can be difficult for people. So it always has to be concrete in order for them to evaluate it. And up after everyone's happy because they go home. <clears throat> um, we tend to talk about the non-traditional jobs. I'm going to flick through a few examples of jobs in just a second. So not necessarily the easiest jobs, but those jobs that are complex and systematic. Um, one of the things that you will have seen is that I teach systematic instruction, which is a training technology. We know that we can teach people how to do complex tasks. Um, we know if they're routine and they're similar each time that we can teach people with learning disabilities how to do very complex tasks. So we don't necessarily just have to go for the easiest jobs. And sometimes things that look difficult are easier to teach. A piece of complex um, kind of manufacturing and putting something, something together would be much easier to teach somebody than how to clean this room. Because when is clean, clean? And how do you make that judgment that a table's clean enough? Whereas if I put a series of pen tops on, I'll know when the pen top's gone on because it'll click. And so it contains information and that makes it easier to teach. And that's what we look for um, in our businesses. OK, this is just an example of a young woman um, and the layering on of skills, as I've said before. So in the um, vice president's office, so the focus was on developing her phone skills in the first rotation. Then on the second rotation, a focus on computer skills. On the third rotation, going to be a receptionist and then finally being hired as a receptionist where she used all those skills that she'd gained through the year. So it's this layering it up as people go through their year rather than 
um, necessarily chopping and changing. That doesn't mean to say that that doesn't happen if people made um, perhaps an incorrect judgment or not a very good choice in the first one. You wouldn't keep going layering those skills when it's obviously a topic that people don't enjoy working at. You would change. Um, but still, they've learned and you've learned and there's something they can take away in that um, experience. Um, this is Annie. Annie works um, in the paediatric dental clinic um, assembling the kits for the oral surgeons. She was the first person who was hired in Project Search and if you ever get to go to Cincinnati because they do tours of that, then you'll meet Annie because she does some of the um, teaching on the tours. She was originally hired to stock um, equipment in A&E. However, Erin was asked if she could, if it would be possible for Annie to go and assemble these um, oral kits. Um, initially, Erin said no, and this is the reason that Erin said no. You might not be able to see from the back, but um, it has dial locks to get into your locker, which Annie couldn't use. So Erin said, well, if she can't get into a locker, how can she poss possibly assemble kits for oral surgeons? Then, of course, she went home, laid in bed, thought about it. It's a bit like, who is she to say that Annie couldn't do that because she couldn't operate her locker? They also changed the locker system and just made them open like car locks, which was easier for everybody, of course. Um, Annie now he, uh, works and has worked for the last 15 years um, in Cincinnati Children's Hospital, um, putting together complex kits for oral surgeons. When she's away, their level of um, accuracy goes down and surgeons will request her to put their kits together because she is so accurate. And she can do it for a right-handed and left-handed surgeon, which she's taught herself, which is invaluable, isn't it, when they're looking to work efficiently. Um, this is Heidi. Um, Heidi maintains these um, cribs in the intensive care unit for um, babies. Um, she is a, a young woman who has intellectual disability and uh, physical disability, which is also, um, she's losing some of her physical capacity. She has a very complex job, which led to her having this work aid book on the wall. This... Um, was originally designed to teach Heidi her job to remember the process. However, she's now one of the top trainers in um, maintaining these isolates in the US, and people will fly to Cincinnati to have her teach them how to maintain um, these, these isolates. And this has now become her training aid for other people. I'm just going to whiz through some other examples as I'm running out of time. This is uh, an example of perhaps of a work aid book. So not on the wall, but something that just helps people get through their job. Um, again, you can see there, she's this young woman's holding out something that magnifies it. So she can do a complex job with the right sort of equipment. Specialist post deliveries. You don't have to be able to work to deliver post. Um, a data specialist, so again, a complex but systematic job with lots of, in, of internal instruction in it. Billing, you know, very important to get the amount of money that people need to pay you correctly. So quite a high status job, this one. Um, this is James, who works in administration and training. So he, if you came on an event like this, he would be the guy that would put together all the paperwork that you receive. Um, service centre technician, so again, receiving and then putting out um, the equipment within um, part of the service centres, which is where you go to pick up all your supplies for your department. And again, same with the part of the same process. Education and training technicians and administration. Grounds maintenance, so lots of different opportunities for people to learn very different skills. And even if people don't get hired by the business, because um, I understand that you have a moratorium within the UK, also hiring within the public sector um, is less than it used to be. But you, 
can be an invaluable training ground for those areas that are still hiring young people into work. And if we don't, we'll lose a generation of young people with intellectual disabilities. Um, cafeteria, again, whilst it seems a very traditional job for people with intellectual disabilities and the focus of project search is on the non-traditional jobs, if somebody wants to do it, then we'll give them that opportunity. Um, the outcomes of full-time employment, prevailing wage paid by the employers with the usual benefits, um, which can lead to full community inclusion. So this is your route to citizenship. You know, you make friends, you become part of. That's how a lot of us make new relationships when we go to a, um, a different part of a country, or indeed, as I have, to a different country. A lot of it comes through work. Uh, I'm just quickly going to run to this. Is this all right, Marion? Yes, I go over by a few minutes. I know. <laughs> Thank you. I um, talk. <laughs> sorry. I'm so sorry. I just thought um, you might be interested to know why is, is training and hiring people with disabilities important to business? Um, first of all, it, in the UK, there's a law that says you ought to. You may have heard of our um, Prime Minister's idea of a big society. Um, you may also hear what I think about it. Anyway, let's not be political. Um, because it actually works in our favour. It? But it's about the policy reform and people being more included. Um, I'm not quite sure. You know, and, and that jobs make more economic sense. If someone's implied, they can contribute. If they can't employ, then they receive. It's like it's not rocket science to work out which one is the better option on an economic basis, never mind on a personal basis. Um, and, you know, achieving targets um, and an employer becoming an employer of choice and supporting employers to win awards. There's a nice part on the back of that handout from the um, HR director of Norse about what, what being involved in project search has done for them as an organisation. What we've found is that many staff and many organisations are willing to commit to employing people with um, learning or intellectual disabilities once you ask them. The thing is that we don't ask enough. And there's one thing I've learned about working in supported employment for a while, if you don't ask, you don't get. You just need to know what it is you're asking for and to not promise what you can't deliver. And we found that many members of staff that we've been working with who do perhaps more repetitive jobs have really enjoyed teaching young people their job, have really, we've raised the morale of a staff team simply by introducing interns into that staff group. And we've also helped them do their job better as they need to be really good role models for the young people who work alongside them, which of course makes us very popular with everybody. Um, in terms of recruitment and retention, we're, we're offering employers, and I firmly believe this, that there is a pool of talented young people out there that they are not tapping into, and I'm the best thing that's happened to them because I can provide them with that talent pool if they're interested. The, the trick is to help them see that this is a talent pool, that it's not a charitable act, that what I've got to offer them is something that's going to make their business better. It's not a kind of, ah, oh, bless. Do you know what I mean by that kind of relationship? It's a really, this is going to help you meet your targets. Because, as I've already said, we know that people, once they've learnt their jobs, will perform um, better to a great level of productivity and a higher standard than a lot of other people that you employ. Um, and that some of the retention has, has increased dramatically in some of those posts that were hard to fill. Um, we use Lean Business, which is kind of a total quality management um, system, uh, to me mesh that in with best supported employment techniques to make Project Search work for everybody. And it will help achieve quality diversity leadership. We get skill and career development as people progress. We've had our first person who's been promoted to a higher level with enough... Effort. That was a very exciting moment. He was one of the first people to get a job, and now he's been promoted. Um, and we've also helped our businesses, both in hospitals and in North, to achieve kind of national recognition by supporting them to win awards, which everybody likes to do. Okay, I'm sorry. 
finally, Mark Gold was the um, man who um, developed Project Search, and this is what he says, that the low expectancy on the part of society is the single most critical deterrent for programmes for persons with severe disability. We don't believe it will happen. We won't work to make it happen. And I just kind of leave you with that thought because I'm way over time. Thank you. Sorry.